Thank you, Annie. Um, I, I uh, for a very generous introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be participating here. I wish I could be, um, you know, in the in the beautiful location that had been selected with all of the participants um, and all of the organizers for whom I think we all have a great debt of gratitude. I think it's been, you know, uh, putting everything together here has really been, um, you know, a labor of love. Um, and, uh, but that's because we all love the interstellar medium so much and we owe a lot to the interstellar medium. Um, to me, it is absolutely the most fascinating field of astrophysics because it has so much in it. Uh, if you want anything, you can find it in the interstellar medium. And from, uh, I, I was actually just reflecting this morning um, that uh, in terms of the, in terms of the physics, one of the things that doing simulations in particular forces you to do is it forces you to really understand the physics because you have to incorporate it in your simulation. So, um, you know, that's something that we've done over the years is, is include more and more of the physics. And uh, I hope to communicate that to you as, as I go along. So my subject here, um, as, as was mentioned, is uh, I'll, I will be focusing on the simulations, but um, what are they simulations of? They're simulations of the interaction between um, the feedback from star formation and the interstellar medium. And of course, how that uh, affects star formation itself. So here's kind of a schematic. And, and I think my understanding of the purpose of this summer school is that it's providing an in-depth view of the interstellar medium, on the observational side, that means survey, including uh, some of the recent surveys at high resolution, both in and near the Milky Way, and reaching back in history um, at, across redshift to what were really quite different conditions in the early universe. On the theoretical side, um, I think what we'd like to communicate is what a wide range of physical processes is, is at play in the interstellar medium and um, how, how we really try to best understand those processes using state-of-the-art numerical models. So by this stage, I think you should have a really excellent introduction to what the interstellar medium is if you're coming to it from, for the first time, how it's observed and what many of the physical processes are. Um, this of course includes the different phases of the interstellar medium. So as shown in my, uh, I'm not sure, can you see my arrow here? I hope so. Um, yes. So, you know, there are, of course, different phases of the interstellar median, and you've, you've heard about that, how star formation uh, develops. This is the molecular phase here from, um, actually, this is a, a recent release from FANGS that which Annie mentioned uh, from last week, actually. So here's the CO map. Um, of course, that's where gas collapses and makes stars. And then it's the feedback from these stars uh, that, you know, in the response of the interstellar medium really uh, creates this cycle. And so I think of the interstellar medium as, as a, a self-regulated ecosystem. So it's not you know, just stars form and it's not just feedback, but it's really a cycle and it's really a, an, a, an entire ecosystem in itself. Um, and that's what I would like to convey to you today. Okay, so here's my outline. Um, I'd like to start with, you know, really just the basic question of why feedback is important. And then the second part, I'll uh, outline for you what the most important stellar feedback mechanisms are. Um, then I'll, I'll discuss simulations on the scale of giant molecular clouds that include feedback. And then I'll uh, turn to the larger scale, that is, if you think about a patch of the interstellar medium, how, um, how the different uh, processes regulate both the state of the interstellar medium itself and the state of star formation. And as I've mentioned um, to the organizers, I'm happy to take questions as we go along. Uh, Annie will collect them. And so, you know, she'll break in and say, wait, uh, there's this question about that. And so please, please do feel free to ask questions as I go along. Um, I think that will help, help everyone's understanding. Okay, so let me start here um, with why feedback is important. And here, I think the, um, uh, why well, I've written down two equations. Um, these are only two out of four of the simplest set of equations, uh, but I think they convey something that's quite important, um, which is if we look at the first equation, this is saying, how does density change? 
and density changes, you know, either due to um, a positive divergence or a negative divergence, that is the density can increase or decrease according to divergences of this term, density times velocity. Um, and then, you know, how does the density times velocity change? Because that's determining whether there's a compression or a rarefaction. Well, there's a lot of different things that affect this. Uh, certainly, you know, gravity affects this, gas pressure gradients affect it, cosmic ray pressure gradients, uh, radiation forces, which is just the radiation flux times an opacity times a density. Uh, and then there are uh, what, you, what we call uh, Reynolds stresses, which is basically turbulent pressure. And there's also magnetic stresses, um, you know, the magnetic pressure gradient and the magnetic tension term. So some of these are mostly one way. Gravity is basically making things tend to compress. Others can be kind of a double-edged sword in that you know, the turbulent velocities can produce a compression or they can have shear that, that tears things apart. So, uh, so for many decades, the regulation of star formation was considered one of the most vexing problems in astrophysics. You know, in the early part of my career, People would uh, introduce me saying, you know, we don't understand star formation. I always felt that we did understand some aspects of star formation, uh, but I think you can't say that anymore, that it's a poorly understood problem. I think there's a lot more that we understand now, but it's definitely a complex system. And I think that's what um, made people consider it uh, very difficult is because of the complexity. Um, but I think we've made really great gains in understanding that complexity. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share that with you today. Okay, so why is feedback important? Well, feedback is important because that is where a lot of the terms that sort of limit collapse come from. And so if there weren't any feedback, um, the turbulence that you know provides turbulent pressure and provides the stresses that shear apart condensations, the turbulence would dissipate. Um, that dissipation would go into heating, but the, 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 uh, the, the gas would also cool and um, all of that energy would be lost. And essentially everything would just collapse into make, to make dense clouds. And so then in those clouds, the, all of the mass would collapse to make stars. So without feedback, you know, it would be, it would look great for a little while, but after that, well, it wouldn't actually look great because you wouldn't see anything. It would just be boring collapse. Um, and so, you know, everything that we see in these images is the effects of feedback, you know, all of the uh, ionized gas as I'll get to later on, but all of the, all of the processes here are really the result of feedback. And so that's what keeps things going. That's why we actually have an interstellar medium uh, and indeed any star formation and anything active in galaxies actually happening. So on, on cosmic timescales that, that we're still around. Okay, so what are the feedback mechanisms that I'll talk about? I've, I've listed them here and I won't go through these in detail yet because I'm going to go through them you know, one by one. Um, but just so that you know, uh, I'll talk about radiative heating. I'll talk about um, of, from non-ionizing radiation, that is from the FUV. I'll talk about the um, feedback associated with ionizing photons from hot stars. I'll talk about the radiation force, stellar winds, supernovae, and I'll talk a very little bit about um, cosmic rays um, because I think I just didn't have time to include it. Okay, so, um, and just some general principles here to keep in mind. One is that the timescales are pretty short. Um, so, you know, if you look at the cooling time in the warm medium, it's a million years. In the cold medium, it's, you know, a factor of a hundred higher, uh, shorter. Uh, so the short timescales means that that's basically why feedback is important. Um, and another important principle is that in most, uh, in most of the environments of the interstellar medium, the turbulent energy actually dominates over the other terms. So we have to understand where turbulence comes from and also then its, its effects because turbulence, unlike you know, a microphysical pressure, turbulence also creates structure at the same time rather than keeping things smooth. Um, and then two other things to, to kind of to keep in mind are that because there is car space time correlation of, of young stars, um, you know, they form in clusters. So they form kind of simultaneously and in a small space. That means that the feedback is subject to those correlations. And that means 
you know, basically a lot of energy is put in at the same time in one location, that can change the temperature drastically, like going from, you know, uh, 10 degrees to 10,000 degrees to, you know, 10 million degrees. Um, and it also means because it's all put in at one place that that really, that spatial correlation actually makes a big difference. <clears throat> so I'll get to that, but those are just things to keep in mind as we go along. <clears throat> Something else to keep in mind is just the overall concept of self-regulation. And so here, the, the basic point is if just some small part of the, of the gas in the system collapses to make new stars, then these stars will inject energy and momentum to their surroundings of different forms, as I just listed. And this energy will transform the state of the interstellar medium. And in transforming the state, also that produces, you know, change, means a change in temperature from adding energy, but because uh, momentum is added at the same time, that acceleration will produce motions. And uh, so, so there, there, the feedback produces a real change of state in a complex way. Then the other thing uh, to keep in mind in the self-regulation concept is the fact that high mass stars are very short-lived. So that's why, you know, when we say star formation feedback, it's pretty immediate on the scale on cosmic timescales or galactic timescales. That is, since high mass stars only live for, you know, 10 million years of order, um, and that is short compared to an evolutionary time of 100 million years, of like the rotation time in a galaxy. So that means since the energy injection is rapid, you can think of it as that's why it's in fairly immediate feedback. It's not a long time delay. It doesn't, there still are some limit cycle effects, but it's still a relatively short time scale. So that means that um, it can limit further collapse in whatever was collapsing to produce those stars in the first place. And it also, because if, if it's limiting collapse, it may not just limit, but it may reverse collapse and remove the fuel that was making those stars. So that's the self-regulation. You make stars, but those stars prevent other stars from forming. And so that means it will affect the near future state of the interstellar medium and both the near and further future of, of star formation. Okay. so. Now let me turn to um, what these individual feedback mechanisms are. So I'll start with uh, the far UV, that is UV photons that are non-ionizing. <clears throat> and so these far UV photons come from OB stars um, uh, generally, and um, the far UV photons, because they are not ionizing, they can travel pretty far through the interstellar medium. They can get to, you know, as, as long as AV isn't too large, they can get there. And when they are incident on small grains, this produces the photoelectric effect. That is, it ejects um, electrons, and then those electrons will share their energy with the gas around them. And this is really the main heating mechanism for the atomic and the diffuse molecular gas. Um, so what I've shown here is the, uh, in black here, is the equilibrium of pressure in the pressure density uh, plane. So if you match the, the heating from the photoelectric effect to the cooling from various different um, uh, line emission, then you would get this black curve. So that's the possible pressure density relationship. Um, and as long as the cooling time is less than the dynamical time in the system, which is a re, you know, reasonably true, in, as I mentioned, uh, then you'd expect to get close to this thermal equilibrium. And so if you're on this th thermal equilibrium, the other consideration is, well, what's the pressure? And given a pressure, there are, you know, in this range, there are three possible solutions. That is, there's three branches of this equilibrium curve. The warm branch here, since uh, this is, you know, temperature is, is diagonal lines that look like this. So this is the warm branch. This is an intermediate temperature branch, which it turns out to be thermally unstable. And this is the cold branch here. Um, and so in the solar neighborhood, if you just look at what the actual pressure is, that's around here. And so that means that, you know, we would expect in principle three phases, but since this one in the middle is thermally unstable, gas tends to move away from that condition. So uh, what if you, you know, go to some other um, 
Earth's environment. Let me bring this back this up. Okay, so how would uh, in another environment other than the solar neighborhood, how would you expect the, you know, th what's shown here is from a paper by Mark Wolfire. If you change the radiation field strength, so say you go to a region that has, has a higher star formation rate, so the radiation field is stronger, then, then you move up from this to a higher radiation field strength. So these curves are all moving to sort of have peaks at higher density uh, and troughs at, at, at higher density as well. They're basically marching along diagonals. And you can see that the, um, this maximum temperature of the warm and minimum temperature for a cold is basically saying, staying pretty much the same. And that's because that's kind of set by microphysics, that is the particular um, uh, energy difference for the C plus uh, fine structure line. So the, how would then this, this um, geometric mean temperature between this maximum and mix, minimum change? Well, uh, basically you could take the pressure as a product of density and temperature. Um, and so that, uh, how, since the temperatures are really not changing that much as you change the radiation field strength that is changing heating, uh, those temperatures would be fixed. Um, but if you look at, you know, what is what happens to the density if you are in thermal equilibrium with heating that's heating balancing cooling then the density is just the ratio of the heating rate coefficient divided by the cooling rate coefficient so if you plug that in that you know you'll get two factors of gamma and one factor each of lambda and that then you can factor out the gamma um, and here the thing to keep in mind is that um, the since the the, the heating rate is proportional to the FUV because it's photoelectric effect and it's proportional to the dust abundance because it's from, um, you know, heating small grain from photons being absorbed by small grains. Whereas the cooling, since it's generally fine structure lines is proportional to the gas metallicity. Then if you kind of put that proportionality in here, uh, individually with gamma and lambda, that says that you basically expect this, this pressure to scale with both the radiation field strength and the ratio of the dust to gas abundance. So if that's, you know, if that isn't changing too much, if the dust scales with the gas, then the main thing that you'd expect the pressure to scale with is the heating rate that which comes from star formation. That is the far UV photons are proportional to the star formation rate. So the pressure you'd expect is going to scale up and down with the star formation rate. And you can think of then there's a thermal pressure that you'd get, which is just scaling with the star formation rate with some coefficient, which actually depends on you know, the rate coefficients for photoelectric heating and for the fine structure cooling. But the key point here is you get a kind of linear relationship between star formation rate and thermal pressure. So that's an important point and I'll come back to that. So then um, let me turn now to another of the feedback source uh, processes, which is photoionization. And the EUV photons here are the ones that actually ionize uh, hydrogen. <clears throat> so either if you have an individual O star or if you have a cluster that has several uh, O and B stars or even many O and B stars, uh, the radiation will photoionize nearby gas. And uh, basically, what energy do you get out of it? You get everything above what you need to ionize the electron itself. So that energy gets shared with the surrounding gas and that you know, allows you to maintain a temperature that's close to 10,000 degrees, varies a little bit depending on the exact spectrum of, of the stars and how far you, away you are from the, um, the ionizing source because photons get used up. Uh, so the ionizing photon rate, if you have a fully sampled IMF, <clears throat> is just proportional to the total stellar mass of the cluster. This is not the mass of an individual star, but the mass of a cluster. Um, and this coefficient, if you have a fully sampled IMF is about like this. So three times 10 to the 13 photons per second per gram. Um, and of course this ionization, uh, you know, the probably one of the first things you learned in, in astronomy was the idea of the balance between ionization and recombination in H2 regions for a Stromgren sphere. 
So on the left-hand side here is the recombination rate, where this is the recombination rate coefficient, and that's the volume of this ideal strong grin sphere. And on the right-hand side is the ionization rate, where I've corrected the number of ionizing photons per second for those that are absorbed by dust and those that actually escape from this region, so to go to some larger distance. Uh, so that's, uh, but I, I, I will not keep carrying these around because it just makes it more awkward, but just keep in mind that not all of the photons are going to actually go into ionization. A number of them, uh, a significant fraction can be lost to both escape and dust, and I'll, I'll come back to that later on from the si simulations. So, uh, so what happens to a Strom Stromgren sphere? So if you think about, a, say, a, a cluster of stars in a cloud as dr drawn schematically here, Initially, the density that appears in the Stromgren calculation would be the, you know, the average surrounding density in the cloud. And you can plug that in, solve for the uh, radius, and that gives you the initial radius of the Stromgren sphere. But of course, since in doing this, in photoionizing, you have raised the temperature, say, from 10 or 20 degrees to 10,000 degrees. It's hugely overpressured. So that tends to drive expansion. And when you drive expansion, that means the H2 region increases in size. This is shown, you know, very idealized way here, but I'll get to the simulations later that show it's not quite like that, <laughs> although it does get bigger in time. So the radius of this ionization front increases, and but there's still radiation incident on this front, and that photo evaporates material from the front. And that photo evaporated material will fill in in the interior, but as I've drawn it here, it's less dense now than the than the surrounding ambient cloud. You still have um, uh, ionization equal to recombination, but now you can think of it as the size of the H2 region is actually determining the density in the interior of ionized gas rather than the other way around. That is, there has to be an equilibrium keeping in mind that this should be corrected for the dust and the escape. But um, now the density is a function of the size of the H2 region and the number of ionizing photons. Um, and you can also solve for what the mass is uh, of the, uh, which is just R cubed times this. So it will scale as the three halves power of the um, radius of the H2 region. So what happens over time? Well. Um, you could think of this as in expanding, it's pushed some gas outward that makes a shell in this idealized expansion. And then what is the force on this shell? Well, from the inside, there's, there's pressure of ionized gas. So that's NKT times two, including the electrons that this is the area. And so that's the force on this shell of gas from the inside. Uh, and you can plug in from what I wrote on the previous page, uh, what this density is by salt using the size of the H2 region. And that says that the force ends up scaling as the square root of both Q, that number of ionizing photons per minute or per second or per whatever <laughs> year, million of years, um, and the radius of the ionization front. So then you could equate this force with the rate of change of the momentum, which is just the mass that's been swept up times the velocity of the ionization front you can, you know, this is a simple, uh, really simple ODE. So you can solve to obtain the radius of the ionization front in time. And it scales as the four sevenths power. This, so this is the Spitzer solution from, I think from the 1960s, um, the Spitzer solution for the expansion of an ionization, um, of an H2 region ionization front. And it scales also as, as this four sevenths power of this um, ionized gas sound speed, which is about 10 kilometers a second times time. And then the original radius of the Stromgren sphere uh, using the unperturbed density of the gas as, as written here. One thing to notice is that this is actually pretty insensitive to the number of ionizing photons per second and to the density. This only goes as the you know, one seventh power. So it actually is not that sensitive to you know, what the how powerful the H2 region is, which is one of the interesting features of, of this. Um, and so uh, in terms of the, the time dependence. So it's expanding though, as roughly, you know, the, roughly the square root of time. So um, the, and this has an implied injection rate of momentum per unit time, which is basically a force 
Uh, and it's useful to scale, and I'll talk about this in each case, that to scale the momentum injection rate relative to, um, sorry about the arrow here, relative to the mass of the cluster that's producing it. So basically because feedback always tends to be proportional to the total amount of you know, mass of stars or the mass of the star cluster that's producing the feedback. So it's useful to you know, divide that out and then you have kind of per unit mass feedback. Um, and then what's written here, you can see the scaling. So keep in mind, since this is a momentum per unit time per unit mass, it will have units of uh, velocity per time. And so in this case, the uh, velocity is, you know, the characteristic velocity on a million year time scale would be 190 kilometers a second. So that's, you know, pretty large velocity. And I've scaled to a cluster of a thousand solar masses and a radius of the H2 region of 10 parsecs. So that's kind of a typical H2 region scale, a typical cluster mass. And so that is the you know, velocity, um, kind of a characteristic velocity that you would get from that. And that is uh, for the uh, zero age main sequence fully sampled IMF. Of course, that does decline in time um, since O stars don't you know, live that long, that is declining in time on a like 5 million year time scale. Okay, so Eve, sorry to interrupt. This is a little uh -huh. bit of that. Um, somebody asked for some clarification on the alpha yes. B in the. Uh, ah, so yes, so alpha B is the recombination rate coefficient. Uh, so that is what we call the case B recombination rate coefficient. So that includes recombinations to everything except the n equals one level. And the reason you don't include the n equals one level is that if a photon recombines to that level you basically just get the photon back again. So that's why we, you know, case A includes that, case B doesn't. Uh, and that's what that alpha B is. Thanks, uh, I should have mentioned that. Okay. So, um, so the, uh, of course that, that spherical case is only for embedded H2 regions, even in the idealized case, but H2 regions are, you know, we can see them. So they're not in general fully embedded. Um, and in fact, both radiation and gas can escape. And so the simplest version of this is what's called a blister H2 region, where the H2 region is on the surface. And um, so in this case, you, what's drawn schematically here is where radiation can be incident on this, this face. And then it is basically the, the, radi the radiation incident causes, you know, photons, uh, causes evaporation of, of uh, material, ionized material from the surface. And if there's kind of no, no, nothing holding it in, it can expand out. And what that's what's shown schematically here. The gas is streaming away at something of order the sound speed, which is about 10 kilometers a second. And then what do you expect for the photo evaporation rate from the surface? Well, it should be something like the, um, this should have been a, 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 a this is the density times the sound speed, which is, you know, uh, of order 10 kilometers a second times the area of that, um, of that hemisphere. And so that area is going to be like two pi r squared, um, but basic scaling is r squared. And then what about the density here? Well, you still have to maintain ionization, oops, recombination um, uh, balance. So that Ni will still be set by the, the ionizing photon source and the size of this H2 region, even if it's a blister H2 region. And so, um, so that's what Ni is. And if you put these things together, you get the photo evaporation rate, which basically scales with the radius and the uh, photon rate to the one half power, again, with the case B recombination of coefficient. And this is the um, ionized gas sound speed or velocity. So at the same time, it produces a back reaction, what's shown in red here, the force, which is the back reaction force on the rest of the cloud, pushing the cloud away. Um, and that just scales as the density uh, times the square of the sound speed, that's the pressure uh, times the area. And uh, you can, if you check back to the previous slide, that's very similar to the gas pressure force on an embedded H2 region, which is not surprising because the density is the same. Um, and the temperature is the same. <clears throat> okay. 
Uh, but the key thing to look, notice here is that ionized gas is directly leaving the star formation region. And we'll see that that in the simulations, you know, and we know in the observations that you've heard about, uh, that is certainly happening all the time when you have H2 regions. Okay, so in addition to um, these, uh, the kind of what the energy of photons is doing, the, the momentum of photons is actually in itself important. And so if we think about both the UV and optical photons, when they are absorbed, they have a momentum which is equal to their energy divided by the speed of light because, you know, um, uh, because momentum times the speed of light is the energy um, for relativistic particles like photons. Um, and so every place a photon is absorbed or scattered, it imparts momentum to the matter that it interacted with, whether that is, <clears throat> Um, uh, you know, the nucleus of an H where it was photoionized or uh, a, dust, a dust grain. And so that momentum actually is important because it's a direct force in itself. So if you take the luminosity of the star cluster, again, assuming fully sampled, then the ratio, the luminosity will just scale with the mass of a cluster with this proportionality. Um, and so uh, then the total radiation pressure force, you take that luminosity and you divide by C and it's just proportional to uh, the mass of the star cluster. So this is P dot, it's a force. And so if we take that P dot and divide by the mass of the cluster, then we'll get something that looks like this, just as before for the case of the ionized, um, uh, the pressure of ionized gas. This is has units of, of velocity divided by a time, but now instead of you know this being 190 kilometers per second per million years, it's an order of magnitude less than that. So that's already telling you that you know the for kind of typical numbers, the um, ionized gas is really the pressure of ionized gas is really the most important thing at, at scales of GMCs. Uh, but this is actually still not insignificant. And in particular, although there's no dependence on radius or size here on the right-hand side, there was for the previous, um, for the gas pressure. And therefore, if you go to small enough sizes or large enough masses or luminosities, the radiation pressure force is actually more than um, the, the gas pressure force. So, uh, so for example, if you had a cluster of 10,000 solar masses, then at the time the H2 region is less than a parsec in size, the radiation pressure force would actually be more important. As it expands, the gas pressure force would be more important, but at the early stages, radiation pressure would be more important. <clears throat> so that's the direct radiation pressure force. There's also uh, the um, force from reprocessed radiation and that is the radiation that's absorbed by dust and then re-emitted in the infrared. So these photons can be multiply absorbed or scattered. Um, and the radiation force is just proportional to the optical depth uh, of the material that has, the radiation has been transferred through. So if you have, um, in this case, suppose you have a shell uh, that's been swept up then the force on that shell is just, again, it's the you know, luminosity over C times the optical depth. And you can actually compare to the gravitational force from the cluster on the same shell, which is just the mass of the cluster times the mass of the shell over R squared. Um, and uh, so that mass over R squared is just the surface density, mass surface density of the shell. So you can compare this radiation force with this gravitational force. And that is what we know as an Eddington ratio because uh, Sir Arthur Eddington was the first person to kind of look at this, not necessarily in this context, but just look at this overall. So this Eddington ratio of forces uh, for reprocessed radiation is just proportional to the opacity in the infrared and to this light to mass ratio, volumetric uh, light, light to mass ratio. So, if you just look at the numbers here, um, the maximum of the infrared opacity, you know, is maybe when the temperature is around 100 Kelvin, uh, and the maximum is is actually less than the value you would need to get this ratio to be one. So that means that if you just, you know, 
consider a star cluster and its gravity and the radiation force that it imposes on through uh, just on the on the dust from the reprocessed radiation, you can't really get to something that's super Eddington. So, um, so, so this is important because uh, that means that in order for the reprocessed radiation to have dynamical consequences, even though it can be, you know, it seems like it gets larger and the force itself gets larger and larger as you have higher and higher optical depth, but gravity is also getting larger and larger at higher optical depth. So, you know, it doesn't really help you unless you have either a top heavy IMF, which would increase this luminosity to mass ratio, or if you have a dust, an enhancement in the dust abundance. And I'll get back to that as well with the simulations. So um, then there are stellar winds. So of course, stars are not producing just radiation. Uh, the atmospheres of O stars are driven out by, you know, the, radi the UV radiation is absorbed in the atmosphere itself. That creates a wind, uh, which is expanding at a thousand or more kilometers a second, a very fast wind. Um, and so this fast wind will in general shock because it's going at really high velocity and it runs into other material. And that creates a, a, a hot bubble of million degrees or more. And if you ask what is the energy injection rate, um, if you take uh, the, which is basically the mass loss rate in the wind times the square of the velocity of the wind. And again, I'm dividing by the mass of the cluster. That's a, kind of a typical number for a fully sampled IMF. The classical solution for the, this kind of expanding hot bubble uh, dates to the 1970s. Um, and there's a, a very famous paper by Weaver et al., Weaver McCray et al., um, which gives the expansion rate of this kind of bubble, which has a with a constant uh, input luminosity source. This radius expands as the three fifth power of time. And the corresponding um, momentum input rate, again, we're getting a pretty large number uh, if you use kind of characters, typical time scales and densities. Although this looks very promising as a feedback mechanism. However, and there's a big, big however here, in fact, most of this energy that goes in ends up being lost to cooling because as I'll show you, there's an, the interface is actually um, fairly turbulent and that energy gets, ends up being lost to, to cooling. Um, so you really don't get much of that, that um, energy uh, driving a bubble. And instead the momentum injection rate is actually much lower. It's just the close to the initial wind um, uh, input rate, which is only about, um, again, using the same units, nine kilometers a second per million years. So you can see, you know, this is two orders of magnitude down uh, because, you know, a, like only 1% of the original energy um, or, or momentum is left in the cloud after you lose most of that to cooling. So this ends up being not, you know, it's not completely insignificant. It's actually comparable to the radiation pressure force, but it's much less than you would have expected um, in this kind of first calculation of this, basically because the losses are so strong. So finally, there's supernovae. Um, and you know, what does a supernova do? Well, if you have a supernova explosion, that creates a blast wave. This blast wave expands out in what's um, the classical solution for that is called the Sedov-Taylor solution. And what's shown here, actually for, for different background densities, you can scale the solutions and they look very, very similar for different background densities. Um, if you just scale relative to the time of shell formation and the radius of shell formation. And this shell formation is basically, when does this expanding shell, you know, shocked, when does the shock cool? Well, it cools when the shock velocity is about 200 kilometers a second, because at that time, the um, post-shock temperature is low enough that the cooling is strong. And uh, basically the cooling time becomes shorter than the dynamical time. So it cools and it makes a thin shell uh, bounding the uh, expanding blast wave. Here we go. So it keeps expanding, but now the energy rather being than being constant is dropping. And, um, and what you can see here is the mass of hot gas reaches a maximum at that time and then it's decreasing. 
Um, so the maximum is about a thousand solar masses of hot gas, and then it decreases after this time due to cooling. And if we look at the momentum, the momentum, you know, has, has just secularly increased, and then the rate of increase slows down because you have some hot gas pressure, but that's decreasing all the time. So you basically get to about 50% more <clears throat> momentum than you had at the time of shell formation. But this momentum is still 10 times greater than what the initial e ejecta were. So that's actually quite a significant increase in this set of phase. <clears throat> so, and here's, um, uh, here's an example of a supernova expanding in what is more like a real interstellar medium, which is not uniform, but is cloudy. And um, uh, so you can see that, that material gets swept up, both the cold clouds and the warm medium gets swept up by the expanding shell. Um, and this is again showing, so each of these curves is for a different background realization that is different you know, structure, which changes things a little bit, but you can still see that they're all sort of similar. They have a maximum mass, which is a thousand solar masses of hot gas, um, and they reach similar plateaus in the momentum. And that plateau in the momentum is about three times 10 to the five solar masses kilometers a second. It's pretty insensitive to the ambient density. And the reason for that is that the momentum is basically just energy divided by the velocity of the shell when it cools, and that's pretty insensitive to the ambient density. So, you know, it, it scales very weakly with the ambient density. So, um, of course, stars are correlated, uh, young stars are correlated in clusters, and this is what's showing what happens as a result of that. You can't see the cluster here, but basically we're setting off many supernova explosions, one after another. And that, if you look at the scale here, this is now, you know, a much larger scale. You can create a super bubble from a cluster. Um, and it turns out though that the, so what's shown here is the momentum per supernova. And so if you take the number of supernovae and you divide by, um, uh, uh, you take the total momentum and you divide by like the total momentum in the shell and you divide by the number of supernovae that have happened, you can see that the momentum per supernova is really pretty similar to the momentum of one individual supernova. It's still around um, 10 to the five solar masses um, kilometers a second. So that's kind of important because that's really a kind of a characteristic number for what you get from supernovae. Okay, so that um, completes the kind of preview of what the, um, what the uh, feedback sources are. And I'm going to turn now to what they do. Um, I'll just so go you, there was one question that we had, yeah. um, sure. which is in your uh, summary of the different feedback mechanisms and you yep. sort of, in your sort of estimates of which ones are dominant, um, you always mentioned that this was on the case of a fully sampled IMF. Yes. Um, and so there was a question as, well, <laughs> you know, how does that picture change with time? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, as the sort of massive stars die before the others, you know, could you describe how the different mechanisms? Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, because so that's for a fully sampled IMF, and you get to that when the you know for zero age main sequence. Um, first of all, you have to have at least about a thousand solar masses before you have a fully sampled zero age main sequence. Otherwise, you know you won't fully sample. There just aren't enough stars. Um, and then over time, of course, the more massive ones die first. So. What that means is if you look at the um, luminosity to mass over time, the bolometric luminosity does not drop off that fast um, because that's more from, you know, not the most massive stars, but the ionizing photons are from the most massive stars. And therefore that um, ratio of Q to M is actually decreasing much more steeply. So one of the things that means is that the, the gas pressure force from ionized gas relative to the radiation pressure force would also decrease in time, you know, on a five, say a five million year time scale. However, uh, if, if um, the effects are taking place in less than five million years, it doesn't really matter so much from the point of view of clouds and, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So yeah, thanks for that question. Yep. And we had one more. <laughs> yep, yep, Which great. Does the fact that the ISM is structured, so mm -hmm. it's gas, filaments and disk gas, 
Does that make a difference in the effect of the injection of momentum? So um, it doesn't make a difference to what's injected, but it does make a big difference to what it does. And that's what I'm just about to get to. So excellent transition point. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I probably need to pick up the pace a bit. Um, so, uh, so what I'll be talking about next is what what is the effects of this feedback on scales of individual clouds, like you know the Orion cloud, which we know and love. <clears throat> and so, uh, so here one of the very basic questions is, you know, if you have feedback, how does that limit uh, the star formation efficiency in a given cloud? But more generally, how does it regulate the evolution of that cloud? And uh, so, let me. First, to summarize what we mean by when we talk about star formation efficiency. So basically the observed efficiency is if you just count up all the mass in stars, you can do that different ways uh, using like the mid infrared, um, just the total infrared, you can use free free, uh, or you can count individual low mass stars if you can resolve them. So there are lots of different ways to get the total stellar mass um, here in the numerator and then you're dividing by, in observations, all you can do is divide by what you see directly, that is the sum of the mass of stars and gas. Uh, however, from, for a theorist, there is an intrinsic rather than an observed star formation efficiency, and that's the uh, final stellar mass divided by the initial gas mass. These will differ from each other because the gas mass initially Initially, you don't have all the stars, but you do have all the gas. But if you look later in time, a lot of the gas may be gone and you do see the stars, but you don't see the gas. So, you know, you can really only get this statistically, uh, but if you have a steady star formation rate, then, then generally the observed, um, the, the, what you see will be on average about half of what the final would be. Um, so that's a sort of a useful rule of thumb. Now, looking at the observations, um, the, this average is about of order 1% lifetime star formation efficiency if you sort of look at this. But there's a pretty wide range from very, very small to very large, and, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. That may be in part due to being at different stages of evolution um, in terms of the, you know, you haven't formed all the stars or gas has been down here, you haven't formed all the stars up here you know, some of the gas may already have been expelled. Um, and this has been, you know, this is, this, these are all Milky Way, um, but it's you know, kind of similar extra galactic and as I think you may have heard in other lectures. Okay, so, so I'll start with what does radiation do? Uh, because if you just look at the numbers, that seems like the most important thing. So we'd like to quantify that theoretically. And before I get to the simulations, let me just, uh, sort of show you schematically what we would expect if we do the H2 region and we don't consider just one source, but we put them together. That is, we include the radiation force and we include the force of the gas pressure uh, from ionized gas. Um, and this N is you know, just scaling with the um, ionizing photon rate and the size in the usual strong grin sphere way. This one, um, so this term, uh, this term is more important when the H2 region is small. This term, since it scales as r to the one half, is more important when it's large. And the cloud would be disrupted if the velocity is large enough when it gets to the edge of the cloud. So that would require some minimum luminosity or some minimum ionizing photon rate. And that has to correspond to some minimum star formation efficiency to be able to destroy a cloud. So if we just look at these one at a time, the radiation pressure force would scale as you know the mass of the cluster times this um, ratio of, of um, uh, light to mass. And then the gravitational force just scales like this. So you can compare these and ask, what is the minimum efficiency of star formation you need in order for the radiation force to exceed the gravitational force? And that basically scales with the surface density of the cloud. So you'd expect a higher star formation efficiency for clouds of higher surface density. So hold that thought. Um, similarly, if you do the, a similar thing of, of looking at the force from ionized gas pressure for a spherical H2 region, and again, comparing to gravity, again, you expect a higher star formation efficiency 
for a high a higher surface density cloud, um, just because you know gravity is more important in comparison to um, the 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 pressure force. <clears throat> so um, so if you do this kind of spherical uh, evolution and balance, and you look at what would the minimum star formation efficiency be in a, you know, you could use different criteria for this. You could say, well, it's destroyed if the shell velocity is, exceeds the escape velocity. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the preferred one. That's the one in black. And that says that you'd expect an efficiency here, you know, of order a few percent. And that's what's shown here for different cloud masses, different cloud surface densities doing this kind of spherical calculation. And just one thing to show you here um, is that, uh, so each of these solid lines is the predicted star formation efficiency for a spherical model. Um, it's increasing as you go to higher surface density for exactly the reasons I just explained. Um, what's shown in the green band here is evolution that transitions from totally gas pressure dominated to radiation pressure dominated. Above that, it's always radiation pressure dominated evolution, and below that, it's always gas pressure dominated. But the basic point here is you'd expect for the spherical case and a star formation efficiency, you know, between for kind of typical uh, masses of clouds and surface densities of clouds, something in this range between, you know, 1% and a few tens of percent. But of course, real H2 regions are not spherical. So let's ask, you know, if you do this photo evaporation thing, then what happens? Rather than pushing on the neutral gas, you just let the ionized gas escape on its own. And you can, again, make it use this estimate of the photo evaporation rate, multiply by kind of a characteristic time scale, which would be the free fall time of a cloud. And you could lose you know, everything that doesn't go into stars within a free fall time, provided that the star formation efficiency is sufficiently large. How does that scale? Again, it increases with the surface density of cloud now in a slightly different way. But again, you'd expect a higher star formation efficiency when the cloud surface density is higher. So that's the expectation. And let's see what happens in the simulations. So I'll start with a simulation um, which is uh, just, uh, so this just includes non-ionizing radiation. And you can see, so each of these little spheres here is a, 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 a subcluster that forms, and this is driving away material um, uh, from the, just from the radiation pressure force. And you can see that over time, more and more material is, is removed. And so, uh, each of these dots here represents a simulation like that. And um, so, so the spherical calculation here is, is uh, what I showed you before is way down here. So that's, you know, that dashed line way down here. This is the result from the simulations. What's going on? Why is it so much higher star formation efficiency? And the basic reason is that clouds are, you know, as, as one of the questions was, clouds and the interstellar medium in general are not smooth, it's lumpy, uh, it's full of clumps and filaments. So suppose you think about an individual cloudlet, then you know you can look at the comparison between the radiation pressure force and the gravitational force on that individual cloudlet. But the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, within homogeneity, basically most of the mass ends up being in structures that are much higher surface density than the average. So the star formation efficiency will be much higher than the average. And generally, um, you have to increase, keep increasing the luminosity until you can expel all of the material, even at higher density, um, rather than the material at the average density. And so that's why the star formation efficiency is up here rather than down here, because of the turbulence increasing the average surface density that you need to you know, expel from the cloud. The other aspect is that a lot of the radiation is lost in you know, escaping through holes in the cloud. And so those things together basically mean that the, um, that the star formation efficiency is much higher than in the spherical model. But, uh, and I don't have time to go through this in detail, but you can take a look at the paper if you're interested. There's also actually, you can account for this with a turbulent model where you know what the distribution of density and surface density is, and you can take that into account 
making prediction for the final star formation efficiency. Okay, so with ionizing radiation, again, there's a lot of effects from the filamentary nature of the cloud. Um, in particular, uh, you, there's, there's a smaller surface area for photo evaporation and the gas pressure forces to be applied to, um, and a lot of the radiation can escape. So, uh, so only in, you know, as, and as you go to a, a higher escape velocity, a smaller fraction will become unbound because it's basically, you know, you get to the point where even the ionized, um, uh, even the ionized gas cannot escape because its velocity is not, not high enough. So here is a simulation that includes both the ionizing and the non-ionizing radiation. Um, and these are simulations using an adaptive ray tracing method. Uh, you can see that if you're interested, you can take a look at the method paper for this as implemented in the Athena MHD code. Uh, on the right, you see the emission measure. On the left, you see um, what happens to the gas. This is projected in time. I'll, I'll run that again um, so you can see that again. Yep, there it goes. So you can see that you know, the, the cloud is initially just being evolving under its own turbulence, but as soon as the uh, stars form, they create a high, high density, high pressure ionized gas around them. And then the pressure from that is you know, both causing its own expansion and is driving away neutral gas by the, by the rocket effect. So, and this is just showing at different stages of evolution. Uh, one thing to notice, what is plotted here is the fraction of radiation that's escaping. And you can see that that's actually pretty high, more than, you know, for most of the evolution, at least 30% of the radiation is escaping. So that's important to keep in mind is that when you look at an H2 region, you're not seeing all the photons that were originally there. And as well, a lot of the photons got absorbed by dust. So here's the photons that got absorbed by dust. Again, you know, it's of order uh, 30%, although that's decreasing in time. So that's an important, you know, you can take this into account um, in observations of H2 regions, but those are non-negligible effects uh, to keep in mind. Um, and uh, one other thing to point out here is that, in fact, most of the gas that leaves is actually ionized gas, not the neutral gas. So that's saying that actually the photo evaporation effect is more important than the rocket effect of pushing out neutral gas. So it's like the, for almost all of the evolution, it's effectively a blister H2 region where photoionized gas is just escaping under its own pressure gradients. And um, I think in the interest of time, I won't show you this comparison, but you can look at just the case of ionizing only versus um, radiation pressure only. And these are the results shown each of these points is one numerical simulation. Um, the stars are including both radiation pressure and photoionization. The red circles are photoionization only, and then the blue squares are radiation pressure only. You can see that the uh, star formation efficiency is the lowest if you include everything, as not surprising, but it's actually very close to that if you just include uh, the photoionization. So that means that's the more important effect uh, all the way up to, you know, up, up to here, they bec the effects become comparable at the very highest surface densities. So this means that the, you know, for most clouds we would see in the Milky Way and nearby galaxies, actually the, the photo evaporation, the photoionization is the most important effect, not the radiation pressure. That shouldn't be too surprising given, you know, what I said about the momentum input rate. But the other thing that's kind of interesting is that, you know, even though those momentum input rates differed by an order of magnitude, actually the star formation efficiency is not differing by an order of magnitude if you just have one or the other. So it's not a simple linear uh, relationship. Okay, so what about the outflows that are driven? This is just showing the ejection velocity. Um, and for the neutral gas, it's of order 10 kilometers a second. For the ionized gas, it's higher than that. In fact, it's higher than the sound speed. So it is saying that this outflow has made a sonic transition in expanding. Um, another thing that is quite interesting here is you can look at the ratio 
of what the actual measured pressure forces are in a cloud. Uh, so that's the measured pressure forces integrated over volume and averaged over time and divide by what the force would be if you just took the most simple estimate that is for the radiation, it would just be L over C. And for the gas pressure, it would, it would look like this. So these comparisons in, shown um, here, there's actually two different kinds of comparisons, but if you just look at these solid squares, you can see that the actual force is a factor of five or 10 below what you would expect if you just did this simple spherical calculation that I showed you. So why is the force so much lower? Well, for a number of reasons. One is that you know the gas is clumpy, so radiation can escape. And also, the sources are distributed, so their forces cancel rather than reinforcing each other. So this is really important, both the escape of radiation and the cancellation because that reduces the force by, you know, can be an order of magnitude compared to the simple spherical case. So, you know, you wouldn't know that if you didn't do the simulation, you would have said, oh, you know, this is that you get this lar very large force, you know, everyone's happy. But if you do the simulation, you find out that in fact, you get much less than that force basically because of the clumpy structure and escape of radiation. Um, now, uh, again, in the interest of time, I won't go through this in detail, but you can show that uh, the photo of apparition can be predicted basically using the scaling argument um, of the photo of apparition rate just based on the luminosity and the size of the H2 region. And that does a pretty good job. And that's quite nice because the photo of apparition actually is the main mechanism that is driving the destruction of clouds, uh, we, would, we would say. Um, and this just shows what the momentum is that ends up being ejected. Um, and I won't go through the timescales in detail, but basically the, the time that this takes uh, to destroy the cloud, the star formation timescale is of order, you know, five or 10 million years from the onset of star formation. And that's consistent with the uh, recent observational results from correlation between gas and um, and stars in uh, both galactic and extra galactic. Okay, so let me come back to this question of the observed star formation efficiency. Here, I showed you that it was of order, you know, one percent. But if you, you know, if you were paying close attention here, um, you would see that for a typical cloud, you know, this looks like ten percent. So that seems like, oh, that's not that good. So what's going on? Um, and what's going on is actually that the previous simulations I showed you uh, were for, um, uh, for clouds that initially are marginally bound, that is kinetic and gravitational energy are equal and uh, were unmagnetized. Um, so maybe that's important in reducing the efficiency. And so let me uh, come, come to this question of are giant molecular clouds actually bound or not? Um, and what's shown here is the velocity dispersion as a function of the surface density of clouds. And if you have a fixed beam size, as in these observations of about 100 parsecs, then the velocity dispersion would scale with the surface density times what's called the varial parameter, which is a ratio of kinetic to gravitational energy. So you can see that indeed that scaling is satisfied but what is the varial parameter? The varial parameter is not one as you, you know, the old fashioned textbooks would have it. Uh, this is one down here. The typical varial parameter is more like four. So that's saying that if you actually look at molecular ga gas at this kind of hundred parsec scale, it's not bound. It's, you know, a factor of two different from being bound. It's basically self gravitating, but it, it is not bound. And, um, uh, the other aspect of this is that, you know, not only is the varial parameter larger than one, but also the varial parameter can be quite misleading. So what's shown here is from large scale simulations, you know, we measure the actual gravitational energy in the cloud and we measure the turbulent and thermal energy. And we actually see what is genuinely gravitationally bound, including tidal forces. 
which are important because clouds are near each other. So they feel the gravity of the neighbor and that actually reduces the gravitational potential well. So you can look at, you know, what's the measured burial parameter and you can compare to the fraction of a cloud that's bound. And, you know, that is only really a small fraction of the gas is bound. So that's an important takeaway as well, is that not only is the varial parameter larger than two, even if the varial parameter were two, a lot of that gas is actually not bound if you use the total potential uh, that is including tidal terms. Okay, so what difference does that make? Well, it actually makes a pretty big difference. So this is now simulations where we actually allowed for a varial parameter that's you know, larger than two, that is a cloud which is initially you know, has higher turbulent energy than the gravitational energy. And you can see that the, um, that the star formation efficiency is, you know, drops off um, exponentially as you are increasing the varial parameter. It's much lower if, you know, if you look at the kind of more average value from observations, then that would only be a few percent star formation efficiency instead of 10%. So that's a big difference. The other thing that makes some difference, but less of a difference, is if you change the magnetic field strength. You actually have to go to quite strong magnetic fields, that is so-called supercritical magnetic fields, before you really make a big difference to the star formation efficiency. Okay, so, um, so this is just showing how this efficiency scales with the ratio with the varial parameter, which is the same as the ratio of the freefall time to the dynamical time. Uh, again, as I said, there's an exponential decrease. There's some theoretical arguments um, that explain this in general, although they don't give actually that great a match to the simulations, but the general trend is similar in the sense that at higher kinetic energy, you expect a, a lower star formation efficiency. But the timescales are pretty much the same. Those are, the timescales are kind of insensitive to this varial parameter. It's still of order, you know, five or 10 million years. Okay, so I think in the interest of time, I'm going to have to yeah, sadly one question, skip uh, more Sorry. extreme. Um, yeah, yeah. Hey. Yeah. Um, so the discussion that you've had of the star formation efficiency, we're obviously talking about individual clouds. Yeah. I've got a couple of extra galactic people in the audience um, yeah. wondering, you know, how does this uh, definition of the star formation efficiency, M star and M total, like mm -hmm. how does that connect to what we, in some sense, used to seeing in extra galactic observational papers, which is the star formation rate divided yes. by the mass of H2? Again, excellent uh, transition to the next topic, which is right here. Okay, thank you for the question. <laughs> uh, you went to, uh, we're, 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 we're totally doing mind melt here. So, um, you know, of course, GMCs are, you know, part of the interstellar medium as a whole. And this is a simulation showing kind of how a GMC would form and then be dispersed by the effects of feedback. So, you know, you could consider what is the lifetime efficiency in some cloud that forms and then disperses, but, on large scales, we're interested in not in so much the star formation efficiency, but what is the star formation rate in an kind of averaged over the whole medium? And so here, um, how does feedback regulate star formation rates in galaxies rather than kind of cloud by cloud basis? Although the latter is actually quite interesting because you know they're connected. So here, um, of course, there are these, you know, traditional Kennecott-Schmidt relationships between gas and star formation, but um, that's not the only thing that's important. Uh, you know, if you actually look, the star formation increases not only with the amount of molecular gas, as is shown here, but also with the stellar uh, surface density. So both the fuel and you could think of as the environment, those are equally important to star formation. So why is that? That's because, you know, this is basically representing the gravity, which is confining the gas. And so the state of the gas totally depends on the gravitational potential that com confines it. And I'll get to that in, in a little bit. So of course, we're interested, not just in the star formation, but the properties of the ISM. And it turns out that um, in terms of this self-regulation concept, there totally interrelated. 
and what you can do, and, and I'll show this, this is basically the purpose of the, uh, my main goal in the next um, uh, 10 minutes, is to show you how looking at the feedback requirements to maintain an equilibrium actually tells you what the star formation rate needs to be. So that's an incredibly, uh, I don't know, profound or obvious idea, maybe it's both, uh, but basically the idea is that if you want to know what the star formation rate is, it has to be what it is in order to maintain the state of the ISM. And so, uh, so let's come back to, you know, what are the feedback effects that are important on large scales? Well, radiative heating that I mentioned is important, but on large scales, since the supernovae are actually the most powerful overall, but they really, you know, clouds don't live long enough to see it, but the interstellar medium as a whole definitely lives long enough to see this, the supernovae. That momentum and energy is captured by the ISM. And what do these do? Well, they control the thermal pressure, you know, that's from the FUV, as I showed you. And then the momentum um, from supernovae controls the turbulent pressure in the ISM as a whole. Not so much in individual clouds, but the ISM as a whole. And then, um, the uh, cosmic rays are important for ionization, although I won't, don't have time to discuss that. So just coming back to, you know, as I mentioned, the thermal pressure will scale with the star formation rate per unit area in, you know, a patch of the ISM. Um, what about the turbulent pressure? So for the turbulent pressure, you can look at a balance between driving and dissipation. So for driving, you can look at you know, a patch of the ISM that has some star formation rate per unit area. You multiply by the area and the velocity dispersion and the momentum per mass, and that's an energy input rate. There's an energy dissipation rate, which is just the, the, the um, dissipation time scale is the crossing time, which is H over uh, the velocity dispersion. If you balance these, then you can find out what the turbulent pressure ought to be, and it should scale with the star formation rate per unit area, and then the momentum per mass of stars formed. You can get, do the same calculation. It actually is a slightly better version that I prefer, which is if you just have some spherical injection, how much momentum per unit area do you get going in the vertical direction, which is, after all, the direction that matters for compression, um, and then you can you know, again, you get a turbulent pressure which scales linearly with the star formation rate per unit area with a coefficient that is just set by this momentum per mass. And the main momentum per mass is from supernovae. So what does this give you for the yield of thermal pressure and turbulent pressure for a given star formation rate? Well, this is set by the FUV heating this is set by supernovae, and then you can you know, make an estimate of what this is, or you could do the simulations. These are the results from simulations of what the thermal yield and the turbulent yield is. Uh, so these are from some older simulations, and then we have some um, newer simulations that actually are, you know, include all of the ISM physics, the, the heating and cooling, um, the feedback from supernovae, and that's what's shown here. This is the thermal, turbulent, and magnetic pressure. Um, and here are the results then for how the thermal, the, the turbulent, and then this is the total pressure, which also includes magnetic. Um, and you can see that that increases, you know, roughly linearly with the um, star formation rate per unit area as expected. And so uh, both of these are increasing roughly linearly with the star formation rate per unit area. This one due to the super, supernovae and this one due to the photoelectric heating. So empirically, that's consistent with observations of the relationship between thermal pressure and star formation rate. I don't think I have time to discuss you know, what goes into these observations. Uh, as well, the turbulent pressure is observed to scale with the star formation rate. So both of these things are kind of that we see in the simulations are, and we you know, can predict theoretically, are consistent with what is directly observed. So another consideration, as I mentioned, is you know, what do you actually need to satisfy? So if you think about a disk system like a, the disk of a spiral galaxy, there's a certain weight which is set by, you know, you basically take the gravity 
and you integrate just like you have the weight of our atmosphere and you can ask, well, what does the pressure at the midplane have to be? It has to be consistent with the integral of the gravity times the density over height because that is the definition of weight. And so if you take all of the pressure terms and you add them up, they basically have to balance this. And you know there are, you could in principle consider a lot of different things, but it turns out that the cosmic ray pressure does not change much over the, the ISM and the radiation pressure is not that strong on these scales. So the important terms are, are these ones. Um, and you can then look at in the simulation, if you add the turbulent, the thermal and the magnetic pressure up and you compare to the measured weight, do they balance? Absolutely. So that dotted line is, you know, that is the one-to-one -one, uh, unity relationship. And uh, they absolutely match, you know, not instantaneously because there is, you know, this is a dynamic system, but basically the average values match very well. And that's true whether, you know, this is the exact measurement in the simulation, but we can also use the more typical observational estimates of the, of the dynamical equilibrium pressure. And those match quite well as as in, in addition. So the, the kind of estimates of pressure that can be made based on observations actually do a very good job of, um, of, of describing the true pressure and the true um, weight of the ISM. So, so since, as I argued, the, you know, the, the turbulent thermal and magnetic pressure will increase with the star formation rate, and you know what your target has to be, Basically, the star formation rate has to arrange itself to give you the right pressure. And so you can predict what the star formation rate ought to be based on you know, what the pressure has to be from the point of view of the weight of the ISM. So it's kind of a, a demand for what the star formation has to be. And uh, so here's what that looks like in simulations. So you can you know, measure the midplane pressure, you can measure the weight, or you can use this estimated dynamical equilibrium pressure, which is the observational estimate. And then you can compare to the measured star formation rate in the simulation. And they are all basically following this expected relationship. If you put in you know, the expected, um, uh, either measured from the simulation or theoretically expected uh, feedback yield, which is you know, the, the coefficient here, uh, what do you get considering the you know the heating rate coefficients and the cooling rate coefficients or the the driving and the dissipation you know that's what leads to this predicted coefficient and here i'm showing both the new simulations and those previous simulations and uh, that is in in good agreement with the simulations the current simulations so here's the comparison to observations both um, somewhat earlier ones from kingfish and then here from, from FANGS, the so FANGS is in blue. And you can see that this linear relationship between the dynamical equilibrium pressure and the star formation rate is actually quite well satisfied. Here, uh, it's, the dashed line is from the simulations. OK. And um, uh, the, this actually does a good job of unifying things. So, you know, this is, this is like, you know, many orders of magnitude of the pressure many orders of magnitude of the star formation rate, but it's basically following a linear relationship, basically because the most important uh, pressure is the turbulent pressure, as I mentioned, and because the supernovae that drive that are kind of insensitive to environmental conditions in terms of their momentum injection. So that's why the same relationship can unify both normal galaxies and starburst systems, which is, I think, pretty, pretty amazing. OK, so this, uh, I think, brings me to the summary slide I have here for large scales. And that is that, um, you know, basically, you can think of on a large scale, rather than you have a cloud and you're destroying it, you know, forms and destroys, you're thinking about the whole system in a self-consistent way. And you basically have to satisfy equilibrium in terms of energy in and out. Um, uh, momentum balance, and you have to, you know, satisfy these simultaneously. And the way you satisfy them is you're using the feedback. And the basic reason 
that you know we see so-called low star formation efficiency is because there's a very high efficiency of feedback from, um, from the high mass stars. So here we have again, this is now for a different galaxy from this beautiful um, uh, data release from Muse. Uh, and here's the Fangs part of the uh, Fangs Alma part of it. Um, and you can see, you know, this is what uh, I think of as a, as a unified system, this where, you know, it's a self-consistent system um, that uh, kind of perpetuates uh, what we see in galaxies. And this happens over a very long time scale. So I didn't have time to discuss this other interesting aspect, which is winds, but um, I'll be able to talk about that a little bit in the, um, in the round table if people are interested. So I'll stop here and then uh, we can take some questions uh, before the break. Thanks very much, Eve. Um, so there's a couple of questions in the Slack. Um, Noe asked, um, is the Schmidt-Kennicutt Schmidt Kennicut law verified uh, in the, the most recent simulations that you showed as well? Um, the answer is it's better than that. So this is actually a better relationship than the Schmidt-Kennicutt relationship. So if you go back, I, I, I'm not sure I can, you know, get through, find it in my slides, but, but the basic answer is yes. But if you look at this, there's, you know, this is not a single unified relationship. You see this sort of, you know, this is like two orders of magnitude, right? So that's not very satisfying. And the reason that you see two orders of magnitude difference at a given gas surface density is exactly what I talked about here. That is, it's not just the surface density of gas that matters, it's also the stellar potential. So what's going on here is galaxies with a given surface density have a wide range of stellar potential. And that stellar potential is actually changing the conditions of the gas. If you have you know, a stronger stellar gravity that compresses the gas more, makes higher pressure, and therefore you need higher star formation rates. So that's the, the part that's up here actually has higher stellar density and therefore higher star formation rate. Down here is lower stellar density and lower star formation rate. So the Kennecott Schmidt is not the best kind of large scale relationship. Um, this pressure relationship is really a more, more physically fundamental and also is a tighter relationship between you know, the star formation rate and the properties of the galaxy. So you could say, you know, the, it, it satisfies the Kennecott Schmidt relationship, but that's actually not as you can do better than that if you actually consider in more detail what the environment is. It's not just the gas, but also the stellar environment. Other any yeah. other questions? Uh, yeah, so given that the I mean the model that you've presented is general, and so therefore I assume that the idea is that it also holds through cosmic time. Mm -hmm. So from that, um, can you make a comment about the balance of different feedback mechanisms at high redshift? Uh, and we, you know, yeah. So I mean, this is actually something. Um, one one thing that we've actually started to do is to collaborate with the cosmologists. So um, uh, you know, both. So and um, the. Essentially, what you might expect at earlier cosmic times is at lower metallicity, there's somewhat less cooling. So you might expect the feedback to be somewhat more powerful. Um, it's not a huge effect because in fact, if you consider supernovae, which are the strongest feedback effect overall, they most of the cooling is actually from Lyman alpha. So, um, and so that, it kind of puts a limit on what the, you know, you might say, oh, at lower metallicity, there's less cooling, but there's always Lyman alpha cooling. So it doesn't make that big a difference. You get a bit more momentum, but not that much more if you go to quite different conditions um, early in the universe. So, so you will still have this kind of, all of these regulation effects happening. The coefficients will end up being changed. And that's something that, you know, we're working on right now is, how much difference does the metallicity, dust abundance, et cetera, change? But the basic picture is, as you've said, is, qu is quite general. OK, um, I don't know. You, I think you might have to run, because you said you had a 3 o'clock call. But we've got quite a few um, 
questions appearing in the chat. So I'd encourage people who are typing questions to join us again at four o'clock. Um, and Eve, I think you generously offered to sort of have a look at quest specific questions yeah. in the Slack and answer directly to people for things that are yeah. more straightforward to answer. Yeah, so I, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look and, and, and try to answer the questions in the Slack later. Um, but uh, do do come to the roundtable, and um, I'm I'm happy to, you know, have a, a further discussion there. Uh, so you know, bring your questions there that are harder to explain, <laughs> or that you'd like to have a a, a more you know a more immediate response. So, again, thanks for the opportunity, and um, see you see you many of you I hope again in in an hour. Okay, thanks, Eve. Okay. Um... Bye. Bye.